In this episode, you're going to learn how you can effectively deal with the way organizations currently operate and how the design process works. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hello, this is uh, Fritje Wegener, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 132. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design, what are the things that make a difference between success and failure, all to help you make great services happen that have a positive impact on people and business. This episode, we're going to explore why design often seems incompatible with how organizations currently work. So here are some examples that I'm sure you're familiar with. For one, the emergent nature of the design process where we're totally okay not knowing at the start what the outcome will be versus how organizations are looking for predictability at the very start. Another classic is that we as designers want to dig deeper and reframe every challenge at the start, while most organizations just value implementation and want to get things done. And here's one more that I'm sure you're familiar with. We as designers embrace failure and want to experiment a way forward. Well, many organizations are there just to optimize things and do things as efficiently as possible with as little mistakes as possible. The good news is that there's already a lot of knowledge about how organizations operate and why they operate the way they do. We as a design community can take this knowledge and use it to our advantage to overcome the challenges we experience every day. So if you sometimes feel a bit frustrated about the seeming incompatibility between design and management-led organizations, this episode will guide you in the right directions where you might be able to find answers. If you enjoy exploring topics like this, don't forget that we publish a new video every week or so here on this channel. So if you want to keep growing as a service design professional, make sure you click that subscribe button and that bell icon to be notified when new episodes come out. So that's all for the intro. And now let's jump quickly into the conversation with Fritjof. Welcome to the show, Fritjof. Hello there. <laughs> hey, awesome to have you on. Uh, this is going to be a conversation uh, that I know a lot of people will be interested in. It's a topic that uh, has been covered on the show lately quite often. And we're going to chat about organizational design and the challenges around organizational uh, design and hopefully also find some better questions and maybe even find some answers. But before we dive into that, uh, I'm really curious if you could give a short introduction about who you are and what you do these days. Absolutely. Uh, I'm uh, Fritje Wegener. Uh, I'm uh, finishing my uh, PhD at the Delft University of Technology, the Faculty of Industrial Design Engineering. Um, and I uh, kind of combine uh, my, my backgrounds in, in organization studies. So I studied uh, business in Amsterdam, innovation management in Rotterdam, and design also studied three years in, in, in Delft and tried to combine these to kind of like have a have a perspective on on organization design and I'm really inspired there by pragmatism and so I think uh, a part of this is is about organization design but I think also part of this is a bit about pragmatic design exploring what it, what is a pragmatic approach to design actually and I think that's that's kind of like the topics mixed together. That's super interesting. Uh, pragmatic design, organizational. You you don't have a typical design background, but you sort of merge into design. I really like those ingredients uh, for the rest of the uh, conversation. But the listeners know who have been part of the service design show for a long time that before we dive into that, we do a rapid fire question round. Five questions and your task is to answer them as quickly as possible so that we get to know you a little bit better as a person. Uh, before we head into the actual topic. So are you ready for right, question cool. number one? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. What's always in your fridge? Ooh, uh, oat milk. <laughs> oat milk. Okay, that's a popular one. Uh, which books are you reading at this moment, if any? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm reading a lot the um, uh, the Discord novels uh, for, for sleeping. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, if, if they are good, we'll add a sh link in the show notes. Um, yes. <laughs> what superpower would you like to have? Ooh, 
uh, make people see the consequences of the actions far mm. down into the future. Mm. Long term version. I think, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, what did you want to become when you were a kid? Oh, that was the usual firefighter, policeman, uh, doctor. I, I really wanted to become yeah. a trauma surgeon on a helicopter. I don't but know I also wanted to be the helicopter pilot. That, uh, super common. We, I haven't heard that one uh, that often. Um, and finally, when did you first get in touch with service design? You've been in touch with design in general for quite a few years. Uh, any? Uh, do you recall when you heard about service design? I think for me it was really when I was thinking about okay, what is the what's the place that might be most interested in organization design? And I was thinking that that should be service designers because they're closest to organization design, but they're not yet doing necessarily organization design. So that was really the reason. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Organization and organizational design and service design are super closely related. I think um, almost not entirely interchangeable, but uh, there are a lot of overlaps. Um, what's also good to mention, and we didn't do that in the introduction so far, you also run a podcast, right? Yeah. Yeah. What so is I'm, it about? I'm involved. Yeah, I'm I'm involved in a podcast um, talking about organizations. So it's a podcast uh, uh, about organization and and management. And what we do is we uh, we kind of like read the classics about organization studies and, and management, but we try to do it in a way that that's uh, also relevant for for practitioners. Uh, we've been doing that for a couple of years, and uh, I think it's it's a really nice way. If you don't know yet so much about organizations and about management, it's a really nice way to kind of like drop into specific topics. Uh, we have a lot of episodes by now, so you can really kind of like uh, pick and choose what what you're curious about. I'm also a bit involved in the Out of the Blue podcast of the faculty uh, of the design faculty in Delft. I think that's also a nice way to kind of like explore. Hey, what what's the latest research in design doing? What's the faculty doing? So. I think that uh, both of them are nice ways to kind of like keep in touch on, on the topics that I'm working on. What's the title of your podcast? That, that, these are the two podcasts. So it's one what's the, the title? Where can about... people find them? Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, one, uh, the, one is, I think, just talking about organizations.com. Okay. Uh, and the other one, I think it's on the on the website, but I, I can just uh, uh, give you the, the links. We'll drop the link okay. in the show yes. notes. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So... Um, when we were preparing this chat, uh, one of the things that I found really interesting is that you mentioned like organizational is a, organizational design isn't new. It's just the fact that designers are getting into actual organizational um, design. And uh, that's a good thing because there is a lot of material already that we can sort of study and read and learn from and bring into our practice. Now, um, how did you get on the path of um exploring organizational design and especially from a pragmatic uh, perspective. Yeah, so I think, so the reason why I didn't continue on Delft was there was a, a moment where I had to calculate uh, how thick a table had to be for a person of uh, 200 kilo to stand on it, and then for a person of 200 kilo to jump on it once, and then how often would the person have to jump for the table to break? And I was like, I don't care about that. Like, I care that it doesn't break. I don't find this calculation really interesting to do uh, once. Interesting, yeah, to, to figure out how to do it, but not not again. Uh, and what I realized when I was uh, uh, in Delft still was uh, that I was really curious, m much more around the, the team processes of the design team. I was much more interested in in how the designers work together with the business people, with the marketeers, etc. Uh, but back then, I didn't realize that there's a f different kind of design that 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 tackles these kind of questions. I thought that I was, I was not doing design anymore, that I had to do business and, and uh, organization. Um, and that was also one of the reasons why, why I left here. But I, I somehow, I, I never really came across the term organization design until uh, one of my former supervisors in Amsterdam, uh, uh, Fleur Dick, and she, uh, she, she mentioned organization design, that that's what I was interested in. Like and then I, I looked at it. It was like, oh yeah, that is actually what I'm interested in, uh, and that's kind of like how 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 it all started. Yeah. And and uh, what's the pragmatic angle? Because you sort of um, emphasize that aspect. Yeah. 
So I think so. It, it, at first, it was separate from each other because I uh, so while I was doing the master, I was working um, uh, at a at a big high tech company, um, trying to uh, to combine the practice of innovation management uh, with the theory on innovation management. I was really frustrated because I realized like these are really different worlds and they barely have anything to do with each other. Um, and so I, I, I already had this drive to do research that is practically relevant. So that that's there's a pragmatic side. Uh, and only later did I realize that there's actually a really important person in design, namely Donald Schoen, who also had looked at pragmatism to understand design better. So the whole notion of design inquiry, but also notions like uh, reframing, etc., like all of them, they, they can be related back to, to pragmatism. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, in this pragmatic approach to design that is uh, quite distinct from, from the way that, say, engineers approach design the way that uh, also say consultants or managers appro approach organization design as a, as a kind of like top-down planning process uh, and really much more highlight the, the, yeah, the, the, the aesthetic aspect of design, the emergent aspect of design and, and realizing how often that actually uh, conflicts with, with how organizations now are designed. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, I think, uh, sort of the core of the thing that we want to explore um yeah. the, the conflicts the roadblocks the incompatibilities between the way organizations work most our organization work these days and how the design process works and um rather than getting frustrated and i've been there a lot of times like you want to show uh, the value of the design process you want to show that it really can help progress towards a certain goal but you run into all those um, organizational challenges and as a designer you often don't fully understand why they are incompatible or why they aren't moving in the right direction that you are hoping for um, and we said there are a few that i think a lot of designers will recognize so uh, let's let's exp explore them um is there do you have a favorite one, one uh, roadblock, a challenge that you found a lot of designers run into? Uh... I think so. W one one really big issue. I mean, we, we have that like any time we have companies involved in teaching, we have we have the same issue that they're kind of like expect to know beforehand what you'll get out at the end. That's like a very yeah. common thing. And I know yeah. like when I go to the baker, and I, I, I say, I want to have a bread, then I want to get that bread at the end of that process. I don't want them to like redesign the bread as we, you know, <laughs> as I'm buying the bread. So I, I, I get that. Uh, but what people don't realize is the consequence that you basically, you, you can't design anymore because basically the client already designed something and they're just asking you f to implement that. Right. That's and not yeah, the point. Yeah. This is, this is classic, right? We, I think we've all been there. Uh, you you know that the design process is emergent you know that as soon as you sort of engage in the design process you will learn things that will inspire the next step in the design process and that's how you work you will sort of improvise uh and you use the knowledge you gained in the previous step to inform the next step yeah. but you are dealing with clients who want to see at the start how the entire process will look like right yeah. that's and how do we overcome that? How do we deal with that? And maybe so I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Why is that? Why do organizations work in this way? Where, where, where is this coming so, from? So um, in, in my research, what, what I've uh, come across is uh, that there's really there's very different perspectives on design. Uh, and, and I think in that sense, like engineers, they also design. It's just they design in a different way. Uh, and I think they mean something else with the word design, but at the end they also have a design, just just like that, like uh, designers have. Um, uh, and I think the, these ideas around design as planning, uh, they have been really influential in the way that we organize and the, the way that we manage. So uh, uh, Herbert Simon, who actually got uh, his Nobel Prize uh, for for the work around these kind of ideas. Um, he, he pointed out that, uh, you know, people are not, so to say, uh, uh, perfect uh, computers that can, like, uh, uh, calculate everything. Uh, that, that even though we, 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 we would like to be rational, this, this rationality is, is bounded. 
And so first he applied that to organizations, later he applied that to, to design, uh, kind of like developing his perspective on design science. But these ideas, they've been really crucial in, in how a lot of managers have been trained and in how a lot of consultants approach their work. And, and it's really, it, it comes down to this idea that you can first define the problem, uh, then you can define the solution, and then it's just about implementing that solution. Exactly. And any any good designer knows that yeah that that might be might be possible for problems that you already kind of understand, but for really challenging, difficult problems, it's it's more complex than that. So it, maybe it has to do with the the nature of the problems organizations had to deal with in the past and to some extent, of course, today, and the nature of the challenges that designers typically want to work at or at least can add value right there's there's a difference there yeah yeah i think that's a difference so that that with with all the all the existing theories on, on organization design uh, you can really relate them back to the problems that the companies had in in that period but then if you if you kind of like look at the literature basically since the since the 1980s there hasn't really been a lot of new theory on organization design of course people have worked on organization design but not radically new theories which is before the internet before globalization uh, really really uh, hit off so yeah so the, and and i think uh, this is the thing about organization design uh, that we are dealing with a situation where uh, there is a structure, there is a process, there are people who work in a certain way. And what we want to do in an organization design perspective is adapt that, modify that to fit the challenges that are more uh, relevant these days, right? That's, that's the transition. And the question yeah. is, how do we... Uh, enable that transformation? How do we enable that shift? So from that angle, I'm curious, like what have you found in your research that we can offer in this situation? So you're dealing with managers who are focused on uh, planning, implementation, and, and want to have this predictability because that's what they've been thought. This is what their KPIs are. Um, yeah. And then we come in as a designer talking about this emergent process. What do we have to offer to these people? Um, so I think one thing that that uh, that uh, the, I see a lot uh, the, the students struggling uh, and also the, the sort of say the, <laughs> the professional designers struggling is how do you convince a client of something that isn't there yet? Mm -hmm. Because there's there's no amount of data that that can show something that isn't there yet. Like that's that doesn't really work. So uh, the challenge really is 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 to to build build a case for something that that is not there yet. And that's sort of say one of the things that I really like about pragmatism and a pragmatic approach to design is really highlighting that it's not it's not about how things are, it's not about how things should be, but it's about exploring the possibilities. It's about about exploring what what uh, what may be. And I think that that the the role of design is is really exploring this what what may be. It's it's not that it has to be that. Uh, it's not necessarily what is already, but but it is kind of like this this conditional like it, it this might work. Uh, and then the thing that that really I think gets gets design going, but that's really difficult in organization design is experiments. So where you don't just think somewhere in a meeting room with all the big hats, uh, be that the consultants or the top managers, and then you think up a new structure for the organization, and then you say, and we're going to implement it like this, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, that you really explore through experiments these possibilities that, that you feel are out there and, 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 and how, to, how to go about doing them. Mm. And I think one of the most important shifts there is kind of like shifting away from let's plan something for the future and instead take a design approach and, and kind of like start in the now while imagining how things might be, but really explore, okay, let's, can, let's, let's manipulate it, let's burn it, let's see how things could be different. I get that. And at the same time, I'm thinking about situation, uh, situations I've been in, in the room where um, like out of the 10 people in the room, like one person would be open to this and the rest is, um, um, I wouldn't say risk, adverse but they um 
they look for guarantees. They look for predictability. They aren't that much like their incentives aren't to uh, explore what could be. <laughs> their their incentives are about let's do the thing that we're doing today just better, faster, more yeah. efficient. Have you, from a pra uh, pragmatic perspective, have you found what can designers do in that situation? Do, do you just give up and look for a different client? Um, I think that there's there's always a realistic chance that that you really want to make sure in the beginning when when you're meeting you know, for the very first coffee for the very first talk that you're kind of trying to understand what kind of organization am I dealing with here, uh, and realizing, for example, that incentives that's part of organization design. So in a way, what you're looking at here is bad organization design and finding a way to make the client kind of like uh, realize that. And so what, what I've seen uh, my students do, uh, and I thought that was, that was uh, quite interesting that they basically, after just a couple of weeks in the company, they would just make a presentation and just kind of like give them a mirror and like, this is what I see. Your company is like this or your company is like that. And it's not to, you know, piss anybody off. It's not to say uh, this is this is I, I have done research and now I can uh, I can tell you what the truth is. No, no, it's just a way to get the client to kind of like reflect on on who they are as an organization. Um, and I think the 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 way that that goes against that is experience. Show people sort of say what what it would mean to to work in a different way. So instead of trying to make it right away into a huge project for, for several years, try to break it down and try to find a way, okay, let's just, let's just try this a week. Let's, let's, let's give a, a, a sprint a try. Let's, let's make it really small. Let's just have the client experience the process. Because I think at the end, the, the, the experience and, and the experiments, they can, they can really do things that, that all the talk and all the great slice sorts uh, can do. Able to really, yeah, get people kind of like out of the current current frame and 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 allow them to see things differently. Yeah, so it's really hard to quote unquote uh, convince people of this new approach on paper and through words. Uh, going through that experience is much more powerful, and but that almost creates a, a catch twenty two. Like they still have to make a leap into doing something that's different. They still have to trust you to um, try it out, even if it's for a week. Yeah. Have you seen what helps to help them make that leap, even if it's just for a week? Because if a, like I, there is also a difference between being an in-house service designer versus a consultancy, right? There, there I, I understand there is a different dynamic, um, but still. What, what if, yeah. yeah. Um, what I've seen my students do. So let me just give you this uh, one example. So I had a student who was looking at a high tech company uh, where they were realizing that the technology people and the business people, they were not really, you know, in touch. They, they were not really getting along. And so a lot of uh, uh, ideas from, from, from the technology side didn't really end up uh, in, in a business case, didn't really make sense from that side. And so there was a feeling we need to bring these people together. And, and what I really liked with that student was that so the problem manifested it, it, itself quite late in the process, but he felt the solution should be much more ahead in the process. And so he, he took a, a, a meeting that was quite early in the process and he, and he redesigned that meeting. And I think it took him, I don't know, like four months or so to get them to just do one experiment with that meeting. And then they did, I think, in the end, three, uh, <coughs> three uh, 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 experiments with that meeting. And afterwards, the client was like, you know what? I wish we would have done that much earlier. I wish we would have done that 15 times. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really like getting them over this hurdle to try something new for the first time. Yeah. Mm. What I'm hearing you say in this story is um, like you first have to see a problem. Uh, and you yeah. first have to highlight that problem because I, I've seen so many designers try to advocate design just for the sake of design without actually saying like, this is going to help you be a better company by solving the challenge you have there. And I think a lot of companies don't realize which challenges they have. And if you don't highlight a challenge, like 
then solu- design is a solution to a non-existing challenge and then like it's yeah. it's super hard to, to quote unquote sell it yeah and so one of the things that that i really uh, took took from pragmatism that i think is, is super interesting is the idea that how, how important doubt is so if your client doesn't doubt their current organization design how can you do organization design and so and and so it's something else than selling a solution yeah, it's it's really about you. You kind of like need to to get them into a conversation that that creates doubt on their side into their their existing ways of working. Um, and it might be it might be too difficult at the beginning to get them convinced that if you define beforehand what you get, you cannot get anything that's really designed or that's really innovative. Um, that might be a, a, a difficult sell in the beginning. Um, but it, it, they really need to doubt the current situation. They need to doubt the current way of, of organizing. And if they don't doubt, then it's going to be really difficult to change anything. I have exactly the same experience and it's on my paper over here. Like one of the best strategies that I found to get people interested in doing something else is by creating doubt about the current way, the current approach. Um, how do you create doubt? What's the um so basically it, it's it it has to be on the one hand it it's it's uh it would be that people don't know what to do anymore so you 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 use you, you you delve into the situation and you kind of like try to get out of the situation the quality that's problematic it's so the, the point being that it's it's not a problem over here but the situation is problematic yeah? but you you, you kind of like try to 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 get what is the problematic quality of, of the situation? And more specifically, what is keeping, say, in this case, Mark, uh, from being able to do something about the situation? So either you are like, okay, either there's this thing to do or that thing to do. I don't know which one to do. Or you really completely don't know anymore what to do. But it's really about the, the doubt in the end is about what should I do? And that you kind of like get to this point where there's an op- the, an opportunity and, and a space created to explore, I don't really know what to do in this situation. And I think that in, in too many organizations, uh, people are, are almost making careers, but just right away having an answer and right away knowing what, what the problem is and what the solution is. And that's kind of like how they, how they exhibit power. Um, and acknowledging publicly, collectively, we don't know is really difficult uh, but also really powerful this is uh, i think the quality of uh, designers and design in general that we are very skilled at navigating the uncharted territory so the moment somebody says i don't know like my my uh i don't know my eyes lit up and i think okay this is a great opportunity to explore and uh, i have the confidence that we'll arrive at something good at the uh, at the other side and i completely recognize what you're saying about uh, that solutions and answers are more valued than asking questions, right? Within organizations. Now related to this, another challenge that we sort of spoke about earlier was uh, reframing the problem. And this is, I think, also a classic uh, challenge within the design process. You encounter clients who approach you with um, Maybe not even already a solution in mind, but already answers to the direction where the solution should be going into. And in the design process, we advocate for, well, let's let's ask the five whys. Let's understand why this is the problem before we actually start solving this. Um, but to my experience, not every client is open to redefining, re-exploring, reframing the problem. Have you found similar challenges? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's always what I say that that uh, like if if you study design, that's like one of the first things, of course, that you learn. Like whatever the client thinks is the problem and it's a solution. It's not the solution or it's not the problem because else they wouldn't be there. So and 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 how how do you do that? And I think it's one thing to hear that in a lecture hall at the beginning of your of your of your design studies. It's something else to actually be at a client that is big, that uh, could make you a lot of money. And then from the very first meeting to kind of like poke them to realize, is this actually the problem? And 
really uh, more importantly that to understand that what what is a problem is sort of say a situation where you don't really know what to do next uh, so it's 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 not that there's just a problem out there but the 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 situation is is the problem and you are part of the situation and i think what what a lot of companies then don't realize is that the 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 problem is is as much about you as about sort of say the, the other stuff in in the situation and kind of like uh, that therefore like you you need this this reflectivity to to explore so how i am i part of this problem how is the way that I relate to this problem? How is the way that I look at this problem? How is the way that I that I pick out things in the situation that I think are relevant? How is that already part of the problem? And that that is really difficult. And therefore, it's 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 really important as as designers to kind of like understand what what is actually meant with frames, and what does it actually mean to reframe, and and not just to take it as oh it's just a way to be creative. Yeah, it is. It is creative, but it's it is deeper than than just having new ideas. And then uh, you encounter, you get like you said in a conversation with a client. Uh, how do you pivot or make them interested or create the space to redefine, reframe the actual challenge? I think it, it's it, a big part of this is actually just making them aware of how they currently look at the problem and making them aware of that is only like it's 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 a way to to look at the problem. I'm not saying that it's illegitimate. It's not the wrong way, but it's just just realize it's one of the ways to look at this. And uh, I think what's what's really strong here is is metaphors. So uh, analogies could also work, but I think metaphors maybe are, are, are a bit looser that, that, you, that you try to, to look at the situation from different perspectives. So say if you was that person, or say if, if you were that person, uh, uh, if, if, if this wasn't a, a, a solution or if this, this wasn't the problem, what, what, how, would you, how would you else look at this? And so kind of like to, to, to challenge the, 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 the client to, to, on the one hand, kind of like explore their own experience, um, but also to kind of like challenge them uh, to, to come up with a different way of looking at this. So I think this relates to what we just said about creating doubt. And um, your client might be right about what the real problem is. They might be. But uh, the thing that we want to try to do is to show them that there might also be other opportunities, other things to explore and see uh, if... Um, and they are interested enough to explore those other opportunities. And I think, um, and I'm curious if you've seen similar things. The question I tend to ask clients is, how certain are you? How much are you willing to gamble that you're right? Like, what if we spend, I don't know, 10, 20 percent of our time exploring the other options and figuring out which one is uh the thing that we actually should be solving versus going all in into your current situation and figuring out at the end that it was not the uh, way forward. So I used to have those kind of conversations, but uh, have you seen similar approaches to getting getting unstuck, like getting a client unstuck and getting them open to reframe? I think so. One one thing that really works well, of course, is is storytelling. And I think in, in, in these kind of cases, what, what can work well is, is that you kind of like give the client the stories that show them. So I've had clients before where, where it worked like this. And I think that the most drastic thing is that, that you can just say, hey, so, you know, you're the client. I'm, I'm, I'm the designer. If you, if you want it like this, that's okay. But I, I would think based on my expertise and my ex experience, uh, over three months, we're going to have a situation like this, you know, I'm, I'm okay with this. You, you're the client, uh, uh, that's okay. But this, it's just my experience is that this might happen. And then you have a very different discussion in <laughs> three months later when, when what, what you had predicted is actually happening. And, and to add to this. Like, I think we should put it even more forward that this is our expertise. Like you can hire, just like you said, you can hire us to implement your solution, but you're not getting all the value and the added value of hiring a designer because a designer can help you to figure out and to minimize risk. 
that that you do the wrong thing. And and yeah. if a client isn't interested in that, like you should really doubt if this is the person you should be talking to. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think that that's something that is really difficult and it's very easy to say as as someone working in a university and having a relatively secure job in that sense um but i think there's there's really a point for working hard to come to the point where you can start to be a bit more selective of your clients uh, and to be able to say like hey like this is based on my my expertise i i don't see how, how this would work so finding a way to kind of like uh, put lightly tell the client that I I don't see this working, and I think and, especially yeah. when you talk about organization design, that's even like the service design already is difficult enough. But I think organization design is if there's even more politics involved, and so if you are if you're trying as an external consultant without the proper buy-in to 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 change things, that's uh, going to be really difficult. So when you uh, say proper buy-in. What are we talking about in this case? Um, so I think that that, that top management buy-in should be there. I think that's obvious in the sense of they they literally buy you in, so to say. Um, but also the 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 buy-in of of not just the the, the clients external to that company, uh, but also the the users in in the in the company. So realizing that any service design and any any organization design uh, also touches upon the employee experience. And thinking about that experience, and, and thinking about how how can we also design for that experience, and how can we how we, can we sort of say improve both at the same time, and and involve the employees in this process. And um, again, this to a uh, sort of extent feels like a catch twenty two. Like if you don't have the buy in from the top, um, you you won't be able to get this going. But to ha get the buy in from the top, you have to start somewhere right yeah 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 a yeah. big question mark around my head yeah yeah um so i i like at the end of the day of course um i my 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 expertise is is uh more around the theory of organizations a bit the theory of 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 of, of design uh so at some point i'm i'm also <laughs> reaching what I, what i don't know yet um what i just know in 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 uh, what i've what i've done in in my own field work but also what i've done with my students is you need to find the people that that have this curiosity and at the same time they that that have the cloud in in the organization i think what what designers also need to learn if the, the bigger your projects get is how can I coach a client who's not so good yet at selling internally, maybe, in selling better? And that can be um, uh, like that, 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 say, the students present themselves. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's an easy one. Uh, so also when, when I was doing my, uh, my bachelor thesis at, at a big uh, high-tech company, I was also, in the end, the one presenting to, to the director of, of, of that part of the business. Uh, uh, and I think that that creates a lot of space. Because the students are, they, they just have a different status than, say, a, a normal employee. Uh, but I think it's 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 really about trying to to find the people that have this openness. But I think also the the yeah really the the designers they 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 need to not just trust on on the political skills of the person that is kind of like their main contact in the company, but also really understand much more into the company. What's going on here? What what's the playing field? So that is partially understanding the organizational design. It's also about understanding the organizational cultures, understanding the political games, and trying to see how can we help in this situation to to better get this convincing process going. Yeah, and I think this is the second super practical thing. I hope people take away from this episode. It's like the first thing we said about creating doubt. Uh, the second one is about helping your client to actually sell these ideas internally. This is this is super practical, and you can uh, you should become a partner, an ally, rather than uh, somebody like uh, a client and and someone like it shouldn't be a transaction. You should be on the same team, and you should yeah. understand that your client is probably also somebody who is trying to change things within their organization and you can support them like they need your support and this is a 
something practical you can uh, do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, the other thing you mentioned was about experiments. You mentioned experiments already a few times. Um, yeah. Why do you feel that the role of experimentation and experiments is so crucial? So um, I, I'm trying not to be to be too academic, but but really, roughly speaking, so you have can have kind of like an, an, a rational approach to things. So where you where in your head you you come up with the best way to do things, etc., and then afterwards you eventually do things. You can be really empirical in the sense of you can really look at at current experience and 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 try to learn from that. So not be too busy with with the great ideas, but really see okay how are things actually going. But there's a third way that kind of like combines both, and that is that's the role of experiments. So where you also look at how things are, but where you also think about, uh, uh, so to say, other possibilities, but where you really, in practice, try to see, okay, how does that actually work? And uh, pragmatism uh, is, of course, it, it's, it's actually a, a, a big, big philosophy. Um, and pragmatism kind of like highlights a different way to approach experiments. So when I'm talking about experiments, I'm not talking about a lab experiment. But I'm much more talking about, yeah, what, what we would call design experiments, uh, what others might call more something like field experiments. So where, where you're actually out in the field and, and you try things differently. But it's really about sort of say doing things and seeing what reaction comes. Uh, uh, and kind of like comparing that to, but how, what did I think? What what would happen? So it's 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 a different kind of logic uh, mm -hmm. of that, and that a, a, a really important part of experiments is the stakeholders that you design experiments together with the stakeholders, that you think beforehand already about okay, so let let's figure this out together. So if we were to do this, how how would this go? And, and, and especially how, how would an experiment and the results out of the experiment actually convince anybody in this, in this company? Um, so let me give you an example. So I was, I was working in a, in a high tech company and, and uh, one of the things that happened there is uh, that, that uh, clients were complaining about uh, packaging, the packaging that, that the products were coming in at that moment. And so they, they spent quite some money on, on redesigning the packaging and the, 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 the boss of, of that, that business unit uh, looked at the packaging, didn't like it, and basically threw out you know, <laughs> quite a big sum of, of design work just because he thought he didn't like it, even though there were concrete customer complaints um, uh, and, 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 and really problems also in, in, in selling the products uh, based on the packaging. And for me, there was it was an interesting moment in the sense of like, okay, so there's there's quite a lot going on here. There's there's they've done experiments, they have have the the, the contact with the client and and the customers, all of that, and still, it doesn't really matter in the end if someone at the top can just, on a whim, decide I don't like this packaging. So yeah, that's that's part of how organizations work: the uh, yeah. power dynamics, the the, the politics, um, and the. The way I try to describe experimentation is by thinking with your hands uh, yeah. and seeing what happens. I like uh, the metaphors of the uh, improvisation theater. You put out a joke, you see how the crowd reacts, and then you, you yeah. put out uh, another joke. If we go back to what we started uh, this episode with uh, the incompatibility with how organizations currently work, like um, there, are, there is a lot of incentive on being efficient like doing things the right way, uh, increasing quality experimentation isn't about efficiency. Like it's, it's, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, how do yeah. we, how do we deal with this incompatibility? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I think this is, uh, uh the, the, the notion of, uh, uh, effectiveness versus efficiency. And then the, the, there's even a third one, efficacy, which is, it's, uh, even talked about less. And I think it's realizing like just because you are doing something efficiently doesn't mean that you're doing the right thing. And it's 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 really about that. Uh, and I think so. What the way that engineers uh, uh, approach design, of course, is 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 unless they design engineers, is optimization, and then efficiency, is, so to say, is is really close. But that doesn't fundamentally change the thing that you're doing. It, it just makes it better, but it doesn't, like qualitatively, it doesn't really change. And I think, so what I, what I find really interesting with, with experiments is like, it's, it's, 
The interesting experiments are not the ones that are successful. The interesting experiments are the ones that fail in interesting ways. So it's it, they don't. It's not that they're either successful or they fail. It's really the the ones that fail in ways where you're like, what just happened? Wait, why 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 did, why did they do it like this? Like what, what's going on here? And and really delving into these kind of moments. So like in a way, what what you're looking for in in design experiments is is this kind of like interesting failure that shows you that certain uh, hypotheses, certain ideas, certain assumptions that, that you have are, are actually not right. And and you're trying with experiments, you're kind of like you're trying to tease that out and, and try to see, okay, how, how things are actually. Have you, um, have you seen uh, tools, methods designers can use to create this space for experimentation? And I think one thing I've seen a lot is just don't, don't ask for permission. <laughs> just, just do something and then uh, see what happens. But I'm curious if you've seen in your work, if if there's so, such a strong focus on um, doing things better instead of figuring out what the right thing is to do, that this creates tension, which is in a lot of cases almost it's very hard to overcome. But I'm curious if you've seen ways to actually do that. I think so. I'll answer this a bit differently. So, um, also from 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 pragmatism, one of the things that I found really interesting is that that pragmatism has a has a perspective also on on, on how humans are, and basically what pragmatism tries to do is it's, it's it's not really problem solving, but let's to make to say simple, they try to understand humans through problem solving. They try to understand how how humans solve problems and therefore how humans are, and the same can be applied to organizations as well. So that you look at like how how do people solve problems around here? If there's a problem, like do they go to someone? Is there like a committee that that like what what's the way that this organization uh, deals with problems? And and what's the way that this organization learns? And I think it it can be helpful to kind of like point out to the organization like so where are the new ideas coming from, and realizing that all too often. The expectation is that somewhere in a in a meeting room, someone suddenly has seen the lights and and suddenly knows how to do things. And and what I found really interesting to 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 find out is that in uh, in, in Japan apparently they they have a, a way of of that they call it uh, managing by walking around, where they highlight that the work is happening on the shop floor. So as a manager, you better be on the shop floor because that's where the problems are, and that's also where the solutions have to be. And so don't stay in your meeting rooms, don't stay in your office, because that's not really where the problems are. And that's also not really where the solutions are. And so I think in that sense, kind of like um, uh, also making the client see, hey, you, there's there's a big bit of a gap here about how, how you as an organization learn. But I think the other thing is is realizing that experiments can be super small. As long as you kind of like for yourself have thought about okay what 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 do I ex expect to happen, and also maybe maybe uh, quite importantly, what would show me that it's not the way that I think. So kind of like what what success what's failure here, and then kind of like explore okay what what actually happened and and what does that actually mean. So this is again super interesting highlighting the gap between the current approach and. Um the deficiencies in the current approach and then this creates an an opportunity to bring in a different approach which which could be more experimentation uh, a, a challenge that is related to this is you talked about uh failure in a lot of organizations there isn't a culture to allow failure you, you mentioned when things fail in an interesting way a lot of people in organizations don't want people don't want things to fail at all this is yeah. something also that we have to uh take into account when we're thinking about redesigning or designing the organization yeah the, the existing I, I think, culture yeah so i think one thing that that we have to realize is that a lot of what we think is organization or what's management is just one way to look at this and that a lot of that relates back you know just the way that we talk about school as just a way to to get children to to work in industry in factories 
it's it's similarly also the way that we organize and manage is still really very much related to kind of like the the industrialization and what what was important there and what was important there was so to say the division of labor the the predictability etc so there you really wanted things you know you want the people at the top that 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 knew how to control things they knew uh, knew how to predict and, and plan things uh, but that is of course let that that works well if things are are more or less stable of course back then also things were not stable um, but but maybe they they were sort of say instable in 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 less complex ways than than nowadays and if if the environment is changing so quickly and your organization inside is not changing so quickly not so flexible that's a really big problem and so the way that that still organizations are designed and like with organization design also mean the way that we teach managers the way that we educate managers the way that we structure mbas etc uh, there are also these implicit ideas about how to organize how to manage how to design organizations um uh, and and we we really also need to address these things and and where people used to make so to say a career by by being always right uh, that that we also need to find ways to have people make a career because they acknowledged that they were not right and because they were willing to learn and because they were willing to experiment and 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 do things differently uh, and and kind of like as an organization also realize like you, you need different kinds of people for different kinds of situations and and therefore only picking one type is not going to be beneficial down the line i don't know if that answers your question but <laughs> yeah um well i w- what I'm getting from this is that um, we are currently in a transition phase from a very manufacturing and factory oriented process and an industrial age process still into a different uh, way of working into different challenges. And this has been going on for a few decades already. And will the transition will probably continue for a few more decades. And this, like this makes it challenging because unless you're a startup who gets this right from the very first day, in many other situations, you'll have to deal with heritage as a designer. You'll have to uh, facilitate this transition. You have to accept that um, you're you're taking into account ways of working that people have been doing for many years, and it's just part of the of the game. Now, I'm heading towards the end of the conversation. I'm curious, like, yeah. if we understand that this is part of the game, what are some of the things that or what are some of the areas designers could um, start growing more into to make this transition easier, to better facilitate this transition? So what is the thing that we now overlook maybe, uh, which yeah. is like an easy opportunity for us? I think I think in a way designers already have a lot of what they need to, to, to design organizations. Uh, and I always point to if you if you design a workshop, you know how to design an organization because a workshop is a mini organization. There's uh, maybe not a predefined purpose goal in the sense of uh, that how other people might, but but at least there is you you have people that are collaborating to achieve something. That something might emerge out of the workshop, might be defined beforehand. Um, but but if if you know that already, then you already know a lot about about collaboration. Uh, but I think what what designers uh, still really need is is a better understanding of organizations, and so, so where, do, where do we find that? Well, so what what I found really interesting is so uh, ethnography as as an approach. Uh, of course, I mean it's 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 busy with with understanding cultures. Uh, you have design ethnography, you have organizational ethnography, and so one of the ideas that I'm that I'm working on is is, is what about organizational design ethnography? So uh, a, a kind of ethnography that allows you to understand the organization, but also gives you the insights that you need to start redesigning that organization. Uh, and so I've, I've been working quite a lot with, with my students on, on, on trying to help them find really practical ways to better understand the organization, better understand kind of like the, in that sense, kind of like the matter that they're dealing with if they're trying to, to redesign that organization. Um, uh, but it's it's really kind of like developing an empathy into the organization that goes beyond just the single people that you see and seeing them only as individuals, but starting to see them as 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 social, as 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 a collective, as as being tied together. 
So uh, instead of only looking at, oh, this person is like that and that person doesn't get it, find ways to, to see the bigger picture. Um, and I think that's really something that can start from day one. Like the worst first time you, you talk to a client, the way that you, the, when you look at their website, like all this interaction can give you really rich insights into the organization. Um, but you kind of like need to develop a sensitivity to it. And I think the other thing is, you know, the way that, that say, uh, uh, you and I, we, we look at, at a phone or we look at a laptop or we look at uh, whatever I have here uh, and, and we see the design in, in that. And the same thing, we, we need to start seeing the current design of an organization. And that, that's not, you know, the design is not something necessarily that, that you can see, but that you kind of like understand, okay, what are the different parts here and what are the processes and how are they interrelated? And, and that's really difficult. But I think we, we need to develop the sensitivity of, of where the organization is now uh, and especially also w w what the organization design is now. And... <clears throat> What I'm what I'm getting from this conversation is that we maybe take too much for granted the ability of our organization to implement and execute on the solutions, the outcomes uh, of a design process, and uh, we're sort of starting to learn the hard way that if we uh, make that assumption, a lot of uh, things out of the design process will fail. So it's smarter to actually st also start thinking about the delivery of, or the environment that needs to execute on the things that uh, come out of the design process rather than uh, just assuming that it will happen. Yeah, but I think what I'm, what I'm proposing here is, is more radical in the sense of that uh, you cannot have implementation or delivery, uh, delivery later. Uh, the organization is there. It's it's already there, and you're already starting to redesign at the moment that you that you start having a different kind of meetings, different kind of kind of activities, and um, and see it much more as a continuous process, where you're not designing something for over x x number of years, but where you're really starting now, and you have an imagination of the future, but you really need to start in the now, and that <clears throat> requires basically that implementation delivery is like the same moment that, that you're designing almost because because you're exploring ongoingly how, how to do things differently. And and that's why I like the, um, uh, for example, the theater metaphor, like yeah. the implementation of the theater is the exec execution of the theater. Yeah. Like, of course, you have a screenplay, you have a script, you have those kind of things. But the moment people experience the theater is the moment that it's actually performed. And I think in especially in service design, it's mostly the same. You don't do service design, you don't upfront and then you execute on it. Like service design is is yeah. the implementation. Uh, and I yeah. think that's one of the major, like if, if I have to make a distinction, that's the biggest difference between how organizations work and how the design process works is they used to produce stuff that then gets um, sold and implemented while designers work in a much more theater oriented way where the thing that it's where the value is coming from is implemented designed at the at the same moment and those two yeah. models will need to transition but i think that's that's maybe one distinction that's really important so i think an, a really effective way to do experiments is role playing so i want you to act in a different way let's explore what's possible i give you a role with that role comes new behavior Let's explore that new behavior together. But it's still, you know, it's it's not you're not directly on the shop floor because you're not right away in the production process. Let's still create a kind of a, a, a space called that safe space, whatever, where we can fail in interesting ways. Uh, so so it should be very close to to implementation actually doing it. But I think it's still beneficial to have it in that sense a bit that that you have kind of like the boundaries around it that allow it to 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 fail without the rest failing. And I think in that sense, uh, role playing is 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 super powerful because people are kind of like used to, oh, okay, you know, oh, I'll, I'll read this role, oh, I do that, yeah, okay, I, I could do that, but that gives them kind of like permission to behave in a different way.
I think uh, there is and still will be for a long time a lot of friction that we'll experience as designers bringing in a different approach and trying to get uh, people who are used to work in a different way, think in a different way to lean towards this. If you had to summarize our conversation, what would you say? How would you summarize the last 50 minutes? I think so. I, 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 uh, I'm a bit of stickler with, with the words. So what I, what I really design... So, Organization design is old, but the design of organization design is just a metaphor, it's just a plan. What we're looking at is when does design become organizational? And that's organizational design. And I think as, as designers, we have to think much more and realize much more when does our designing change organization? And that there's already a lot that we do that's already really powerful with that. So it's not that design has to change completely, uh, but it's there are certain skills that we need to understand uh, and develop. And I, th I think that's understanding the current organization and really understanding the current organization design and being able in a moment with a client where they're behaving in a certain way, understand, ooh, that's the organization design talking, that's the incentives, and that's exactly what we want to deal with. And then finding really ways through experiments to to get them out of this, reframe them, and then help them to see things differently. If people want to dig deeper into this topic, what are some good resources that would get them going? I think the, there's a, a nice introductory book um, by um, Naomi Stanford on, on organization design. She's, she's writing a new edition on it. And I think for, for any kind of designer interested in organization design, I think that's a good first read. Uh, but what you have to realize, it's, it's a very distinct perspective on design that might not really feel that design, but I think it's it's a good way to get into that topic. Um, I think uh, the work of Donald Schoen, when, when he writes about the, the organizing inquiry can be can be really interesting, but that's like 40 years old. But I think it's, it's still very relevant. It's a, a very different perspective. And there's a book uh, called uh, Managing as Designing. It's also a, a bit older from, from 2004 from, from Stanford. Um, but I think there's a lot of really interesting uh, uh, essays in there that can give you a different way to look at this. And there's, of course, academic literature, and you can just look online on, on, on into my, my work that I'm, that I'm working on. Uh, that should also give you a good idea of, of what, what organizational design could be. Awesome. And those yeah. are really good things. And then we'll add all the relevant links in the show notes. And I like books that are 40 years old and are still <laughs> relevant today. I, I, I recommend service designers to read books that are not about service design, but about other topics. So these sound like very good uh, resources. I think that's all we have time for in this episode. If people want to continue, I think uh, I can only refer them to your podcast. Uh, there is yeah, probably please. a lot of good, good material over there. Also, the link yeah. will be in the show notes. Thanks again uh, for addressing this topic. Uh, I don't feel like we're done, but at least we are raising <laughs> attention to something that needs to, uh, that there, where there is an opportunity for us as a design community to grow. Yes, exactly. And uh, please, uh, please reach out with, with your questions. So I'm, I'm really trying to do research that is practically relevant. But for that, I need input from practice. For that, I need to engage with practitioners. So if you have questions about organization design, if you struggle with things, especially around the topics that I discussed, please reach out and, and let's find a way to engage on this. Awesome that you made it all the way here. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation. And if you did, make sure to click that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Thanks a lot for watching to the Service Design Show. If you want more, make sure to check out the next video I've got lined up for you. See you there.